Tommy Patera had established himself as an earner for the Bonanno family and an individual who was able to carry out murders on demand for the mob. He'd made a name as a feared individual amongst gangsters. Patera's MO when dispatching his victims was to put them in the bathtub, get undressed and surgically dissect the body into small pieces. They'd then be wrapped in garbage bags and placed into a suitcase which would then be buried in a secluded bird sanctuary in Staten Island. Unlike other gangsters, Patera kept trinkets of his victims to relive the memory. This sickened even the hardest of gangsters in Brooklyn. Although Patera was building a fierce reputation as a gangster and an earner for the Bonanos, things weren't going as smoothly for him on the domestic front. Patera had married a woman named Carol Bogowski, and they had a baby boy, but the marriage was ill-fated and they divorced. Shortly after, he met a Brooklyn lady named Celeste Lapari. They were the perfect couple and their relationship blossomed. Patera was infatuated with her. She was the only person that Patera showed any affection for. When he was with Celeste, it was a different Tommy. Loving, caring and affectionate. There was one big problem, however. Celeste was a drug addict. As a dealer, he knew how drug addiction ruined the lives of the addicted and their families. Fearful of the consequences of Celeste's drug abuse, he intimidated all of the local dealers and warned them to stay away from her. This approach, however, didn't work. Celeste had a friend named Phyllis Birdie who got the drugs for her and they got high often. Patera told them to stop hanging out, but behind his back, Celeste and Phyllis would continue to get high. Soon, Patera's fears of what could happen did happen. While Celeste was partying at Phyllis's home on September 10, 1987, she overdosed on a cocktail of heroin and cocaine known as a speedball. Patera's soulmate, Celeste Labari, was dead. When Patera heard the news, he was beside himself with grief. He went over to Phyllis's house along with Ganji and broke down in tears at the sight of his beloved Celeste. As he sobbed uncontrollably, Phyllis walked into the room, still dazed and hung over from the alcohol and drug binge from the night before. Patera burst into a fit of anger. I told you to stay the fuck away from her, he yelled. He then slapped Phyllis across the face. The police officer in the room had to restrain the raging Patera. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you, Patera screamed as he left the house. Phyllis was frightened out of her skin. Even the remnants of the drugs and alcohol didn't dull the threat of a man like Tommy Patera. Phyllis's days were numbered. Patera vented to Ganji. He needed her dead and he wanted Ganji to do it. But Ganji was not made from the same substance as Patera. He wasn't a cold and calculated killer with the ability to dissect his victims in a bathtub naked. Instead of refusing the order, Ganji listened to Patera vent. Phyllis was a good friend and lover to Ganji and he felt a particular unease about going through with such a demand. Worried for her life, Phyllis left Brooklyn. She stayed hidden for a while but was soon sneaking back to her old haunts. The lure of the Brooklyn streets was too much for her. One fateful night, she ran into Frank Ganji. Patera had spread the word that if anyone knew where Phyllis was, they should tell him immediately. Ganji ignored this for a while and he and Phyllis began to party. They then decided to go back to Ganji's home to get more drugs. After a few nights together, Ganji's phone rang. When he picked it up, he heard the devil himself on the other line. What's up? Where you been? Patera asked in an angry voice. Ganji, still in a drugged up and paranoid state, was scared that Patera knew that he was with Phyllis. He told Patera, I'm with Phyllis. She's here. You're with Phyllis? Patera asked surprised. Yeah, replied Ganji, uneasy. Where is she? Patera asked in an urgent tone. 
in bed sleeping, said Ganji, with the feeling of dread running through his body. Why didn't you call me? I was just about to, I swear, Ganji said nervously. He knew full well that lying to Patera was a death sentence, but scared out of his mind, he tried to cover his tracks. No matter what you do, keep her there, you understand? Keep her there, Patera shouted. Not long after Patera arrived, he'd picked up a dismembering kit en route to Ganji's place. Bloodthirsty and ready to reap his revenge for the loss of his beloved Celeste, Patera was in a cold-blooded, deadly trance, ready to take a life. He walked into the apartment in a stealth-like mode and snuck into the bedroom. He took a few seconds to savor the moment. He then aimed his gun at Phyllis and pumped several bullets into her head as she slept. It was the end of Phyllis Birdie. He then dragged her body into the bathtub and began to dismember her. Like numerous victims before her, Phyllis was taken to be buried at Patera's personal graveyard in Staten Island. Ganji was sickened by the murder, but he felt powerless to do anything against a man like Patera. Handling guns was a day-to-day -day part of the mob life. A gun should be an extension of your body, Patera once told Ganji. But for Ganji, handling guns didn't come naturally to him. He would, however, try to train himself with firearms. During one of these exercises, whilst at a house of a girlfriend, he inadvertently shot himself in the leg. In a panic, he called a friend named Andy Jakakis. Then he called Patera. Jakakis was an old school guy from the streets. He ran in criminal circles but wasn't a tough guy. Ganji met Jakakis whilst doing his prison sentence for the Governaro murder. Thirty plus years his senior, Jakakis took him under his wing, almost like a father figure. Ganji later repaid the favor by intimidating a witness on a case involving Jakakis. The witness soon retracted their evidence. Jakakis was eternally grateful. From that day on, Jakakis would watch over the young Ganji. He would act as a gopher confidant type figure to Ganji. He thought that Ganji was a big time mafioso, as he knew who his relatives were and he knew he was working for Patera. He was fond of saying, God put me on this earth to protect Frank Ganji. Out of embarrassment, Ganji made up a story about him being shot by people who owed him money. He told the story to Jakakis and then Patera when he arrived. Being an expert on wounds and injuries, usually inflicting them, Patera looked at the bullet hole with a cold, clinical eye. He then called a doctor he knew. The mob used a network of doctors who were happy to treat gangland victims for a fee and not report it to the authorities. A doctor came, removed the bullet and dressed the wound. Jakakis was pacing the apartment clearly bothered by the fact someone had taken a shot at his idol, Ganji. The constant pacing got on Patera's nerves. Calm down, be quiet, you're getting on my nerves, sit down. Patera pointed to a chair. Defiance about his eyes and defiance in his body English, Andy said, hey, I don't have to listen to you, you're not my boss, I don't take orders from you, you understand? I only listened to Frank, understand? He didn't know it then, and never did, but Andy Jakakis just committed suicide. No one talked to Patera like that, even tough guy mobsters would give Patera a wide berth. Not only had he insulted Patera, but worse, he insulted him in front of an underling. When Ganji and Patera were alone afterwards, Patera told him that Jakakis had to go and that he wouldn't rest until he was dead. I'm not only going to kill him, I'm going to torture him on the dance floor of Overstreets. This sickened Ganji. He was fond of Andy. He was like a surrogate father to him. Ganji knew that Andy meant nothing by his comment and that he was all bark and no bite. He tried to convince Patera to forget about it, but Patera was adamant that Jakakis had to go. 
Ganji had two choices in front of him. Either he would do as he was told and kill his friend, or he would kill Patera. The latter was no easy feat. Patera was always super alert and took precautions wherever he was. He'd always sit with his back to the wall. Whenever in a car, he'd never let anyone sit behind him. He knew all the moves. Ganji knew, however, that even if he did take Patera out, he'd be running for the rest of his life. Patera was a made man and considered untouchable. If anyone killed a made guy without an okay from the boss, they would be whacked. For the time being, the solution found itself at the bottom of a bottle of whiskey and at the end of a few lines of coke. In that moment, he knew he had no choice. He had to kill his friend, Andy Jakakis. It was now mid-June 1988. A former boyfriend of Judy Haymowitz, Toby Profetto, a close friend of Ganji's, accompanied Frank this night. Okay, Ganji said, when the right time comes, I'll turn up the music real loud and we'll do it. Okay, Toby agreed. They picked up the unsuspecting Andy Jakakis at a pizzeria. Ganji was driving. The unsuspecting Jakakis sat in the passenger seat. Toby was sitting directly behind him. Ganji took a right onto West 11th Street. This was a quiet, desolate street. A song by the Rolling Stones came on, Start Me Up. I like this song, Frank said, turning the volume knob up. Jakakis moved to the beat. Unbeknownst to him, he was dancing to his own imminent death. Seconds after, a bullet ripped through Jakakis's brain. The bang was deafening. He slumped forward. The smell of gunpowder wafted through the cabin of the car. It was the end of Andy Jakakis. Ganji took a right, a left, and made his way over to an empty lot on Bay 50th Street. The particular stretch that he pulled into hadn't been fully developed yet, and Ganji decided to just dump the body right there. A plan that had one major drawback that Ganji wasn't aware of in that particular adrenaline-packed moment. A capo named Todo Marable lived just opposite this lot. Todo was a feared captain in the Bonanno family. They took hold of the body and haphazardly dumped it there. In the panic of the situation, one of Jakakis's shoes came off and landed by the passenger seat. When Ganji got back into the car, he saw it and tossed it out onto the curb. This would not sit well with Todo. This was a personal offense. Whacking a guy and dumping him in front of a house of a captain in a mob family was a bad move. It was like taking a shit on his front door. No mobster would stand for such a thing. His family lived there. Trouble was in the air. It didn't take long for the body to be discovered. When Todo Marable found out about the body and the shoe being left there, he wondered what it meant. A Sicilian message, perhaps. But a message of what? The word went out on the streets. Who was the dead man? And why was the shoe left at the scene? Patera felt a huge sense of gratification. Ganji had come through. He'd been given a test of loyalty, and he'd passed. He'd betrayed a friend for the devil. Ganji was sickened. The images of Phyllis and Jakakis would haunt him every night. He'd often try to escape the realities of his horror with drink and drugs. It was no good. The escape was always short-lived. And when he'd come to, all he could see was Patera's face. It was these thoughts that passed through his head as he drove one night drunk. He was stopped by a police officer. After a brief conversation with the officers, they ascertained he was well over the limit and promptly took him into custody. While stewing in a jail cell, Ganji finally mustered the courage to attempt to escape not only the jail cell that he was in, but the nightmare of Tommy Patera. It was this night that Frank Ganji decided to do the unthinkable and turn on his boss, his tormentor, 
to turn his back on Cosa Nostra. It was the end of the nightmare and the beginning of a new chapter, but Frank Ganji would never forget the horrors of what he witnessed whilst in the grips of the terror that walked the streets of Brooklyn. The terror of one Tommy Karate Patera.